Good day. Um, I, I'm here in Latvia and I thought I'd be meaning for some time now to share an idea with you that I had some time ago. Um, and I think it's I think it's an important it's an important idea. I, I it's called the tragedy of progress. I mean, uh, in the 1960s, Garrett Hardin um, wrote a very influential paper called the tragedy of the commons. And what the tragedy of the commons uh, paper was about um, was about ownership of land, basically, or ownership of anything, ownership of you know common ownership, really, like. Um, the diggers would sing in the in that famous song by Leo Ro Leon Rosselson, the the oh, the earth is a common treasury for everyone to share. Of course, the earth is not a common treasury for everyone to share because the rich people have bought it all, uh, and the common people, you know, the common treasury people, the people who should share it, don't share it. What they do is they live in towns and they get small amounts of money handed to them by the government. And in the last 50 years, or maybe the last 100 years, we've seen tremendous advances in science and technology. But, 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 but none of this has uh, accrued much benefit to, to, the, to the ordinary person, although it's accrued vast amounts of benefit to big corporations and the people who control them, and what I might call the rich. I mean, um, so, so that there really is no discourse anymore about this huge variation in ownership. I mean we, we hear a lot about, about income and, we, and most of economics is directed towards money and the movement of money but very little, very, very little is said about, about property uh, and property is not really included in economic analyses that I've seen. I worked with Molly Scott Cater uh, in the 90s when she was doing her PhD on economics and so I had to follow. I had to sort of follow along with the economics and sort of help her, because she's not really very mathematical. Um, and I got in, I got interested in economics. Uh, and as a, as a chemical physicist, I have to say that it's all bonkers, you know. I mean, if you see it as a sort of chemical reaction or as, or as chemical equilibrium or, or the sorts of real things that happen in in science, economics doesn't doesn't figure as anything that you can make sense of. So I thought about all of this for a long, long time, but I hadn't, I couldn't kind of get an angle on it, you know. It's a very tricky, it's a very tricky sort of way, tricky kind of area to think about. But but one thing is certain is that with all the developments in econ, in in, uh, in science and technology and all these wonderful things, these creations of uh, computer systems and mobile phones and, and, and uh, IT and so forth. Nobody is any happier, it seems to me, and in fact, most people are poorer. And as I know from where I live, uh, local authorities find it increasingly difficult to make ends meet. Now, why is this? How can this be? I mean, the population of England has increased by about 12 million since 1970, but that's not a big deal, you know, compared to the the extraordinary in increase in the cost of houses and the cost of more or less everything. So, so my children, you know, and my younger children anyway, Rosa, you know, she can't buy a house. She's no, never going to be able to buy a house. And the young people nowadays are dispossessed of all of this stuff. The old people own it. What's going on? Anyway, I'll tell you what it was. I was, I, I, I was walking across Biddeford Bridge about a month ago, and there were all these people like maybe 30 people looking at mobile phones and I said look what are you doing and they had some game anywhere where they had to look at the mobile phone and find something and so forth but what occurred to me is that they all 30 of them had mobile phones now the mobile phones they had uh, if you look in the shops cost about 500 upwards pounds yeah so then I started to think about what happens when you introduce a new device into a closed system. This is a sort of thermodynamic argument. And that got me thinking about how that destabilizes the equilibrium relating to economics. And so this is my idea. It's called the tragedy of progress. Now the tragedy of commons was of course uh, a method uh, whereby the rich and powerful just took control of the land. I mean, nothing new there. You know, they've been taking control of the land since 1649, when the diggers occupied St George's Hill. 
but it's increasingly occurring. And in fact, any little bit of spare land that any council has now immediately gets sold off for property developers, and they create lots and lots of shops. I mean, at the moment in Biddeford, they're talking about taking this land across the river, a place called Brunswick Wharf, and turning it into shops and flats. So somebody's going to make a lot of money out of this, and this is how this is this is how councils work now. I mean, you get the only reason you get onto the council now is to put your placeman on the council, and the placeman then influences the council to sell something off so that your friend, the developer, can come in and get it for tuppence, and then build on it and make lots of money. But that's but but so that's the tragedy of the commons. The tragedy of commons was a, was a specious argument. That was that was pounced on by the rich and the powerful because, of course, it gave them an excuse to 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 take the common land away from the people. So there's no common land anymore, and whatever common land they are, get shrinks it shrinks year by year. So that's the tragedy of the commons, a scam. But now I'm going to talk about the tragedy of progress. Now imagine that the everything in the world. This is like a thermodynamic argument. You take a big circle and you say this is everything in the world, and it all has a value. So everything has a value. You can more or less take anything there and you put a value on it. And we're doing this thought experiment. You write down the value of everything in the world. Good. So you've got a number. Let's call it a thousand, all right? So let's say in 1980, the value of everything on the planet was 1,000 units. This is just a thought experiment, but, 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 but follow along here now. Now, I used to say that it was not possible to create wealth. But actually, it's possible to create wealth in, the way, in one way, and that is by rearranging certain things that, that are already there. You know, one way would be to digging the coal out of the ground, for example, for example and burning it. And you, the people who dig the coal out of the ground, they sell it to people to keep warm, and the people burn it, and they give them money, and so forth. But let's consider something completely new. Let's consider a new device. Let's call it the mobile phone. And let's, let's say that we can make this by rearranging certain uh, elements that we dig out of the ground, you know, cobalt and copper and silicon and so forth, which elements which were on their own and where they were, were worthless, essentially worthless. They were just part of the part of the pla of, of, of the of the of the of the circle of value, but but at the beginning of the, before this device, the mobile phone, they were essentially worthless. But there is a way in which clever people can put them all together, you know, so they can take a bit of this and take a bit of that, rearrange them. This is an this is a sort of entropy thing, okay? So they can take the chaotic distribution of copper and silicon and carbon and everything that goes to make a mobile phone, and they can create the mobile phone. Now this is something that everybody wants, of course. And even if they didn't want it, they could sell it to them with advertising. But they don't need to, because it is a very useful and interesting device, uh, this mobile phone that was invented. And eventually everyone has to have one. In fact, there's probably nobody on the planet now that doesn't have a mobile phone, from Afghanistan to Abyssinia. Is there such a place still? Probably not. Ethiopia, anyway. So everybody's got a mobile phone. Now, if every mobile phone is worth £500 in English money, but let's, you know, whatever it is in different money, obviously somebody, these people who want mobile phones, and everybody wants it, has to find that from money from somewhere. They have to find that money from somewhere to buy it. Well, of course, one way would be they sell their tractor, or they, they sell the pig, or they sell their wife, or the dog, or the horse, or whatever, OK? But that isn't how it works. Because that wouldn't, that then, then of course, they wouldn't have the dog or the house or the wife or whatever, and they want those things as well. In fact, they're necessary. So they have to find the money to buy this mobile phone. Where do they find it? Well, of course, we know where they find it from. They borrow it. They borrow it from the banks. Now, if you multiply all the people on the planet that have a mobile phone by the amount of money that the mobile phone costs, then that's an awful lot of money. Now, so if they have to borrow the money to do that, who lends them the money? Where do they get it from? Well, I tell you, of course they get it from the banks. You know, fr from about 1970 onwards, the banks can print money. Because they, 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 they will just put an interest ticket on that, on the money that they loan to everybody to buy the mobile phones. And in order to do that, they have to create that money. They have to create the actual pound notes, if you like to think of it like that, in order for the people to, the people with the pig or the horse or the wife, you know, to pay that money to the mobile phone manufacturer. 
Right. So suddenly where you had 1,000 in the world, now you've got, say, 1,500 or 2,000 or whatever it costs. You know? And I mean, it's not just the mobile phone, of course, lots and lots of scientific progress type stuff that suddenly appears, as, as it were, from, from nowhere as a result of rearranging atoms or components that existed before the invention of this device or the development or whatever. So now where you had 1,000 units, you now have 1,500 units. Well, of course, that means, I mean, everybody knows, this is the simplest bit of economics. I think it was called Gresham's Law. That means that everything is devalued in the ratio of 1,500 to 1,000, because there's more money around, OK? Because, of course, the people who sell the mobile phones, they got all that money and they want to do something with it. I mean, what are they going to do with it? I don't know, buy more pigs and, or wives or whatever it is. But anyway, the point is the money is there, yes? So that means everything costs more in the ratio of 1.5 to 1. OK. Well, in nine, well, we all know this is called inflation, but, you know, I never quite really quite understood the, so the source of inflation. The source of inflation on the simple level is that, you know, the workers strike for more money, so they have to get paid more money, so the cost of things goes up, so then the workers need more money, so they strike for more money, and you, that's supposed to be the explanation. But I don't think that is the explanation. The explanation is the flooding of the world with money, and, and the acceleration in inflation that's taken place since the freeing up of the bank's ability, the, the reserve ratio, the bank ability to just print money, and this is particularly bad for America, because they can print money to bank pla ban band playing. And they have this enormous, enormous national debt. And I thought, well, who, who do they owe it to? And people say, oh, well, the Chinese, and oh, the Japanese, and all that. But no, they don't owe it to anybody. They owe it to the banks. That's what they do. They owe it to the banks. But that's not the point that they owe it to the banks. Not as if they'll ever be able to pay it back, of course. That's not the point. The point is there's more money there. Now, this is the key. This is the issue now. Because, of course, people who owned property, you know, like the rich bastards, if you like, who owned all the land, or who owned the buildings, who owned actual things, you know, that belonged to them, before this increase in price, they have now gained all that increase in price into the cost of the things they have. So, of course, the rich bastards buy land, and the land prices just go up and up and up and up and up. Housing prices go up and up and up and up and up. So in, in 1960, my house, Castle Cottage in Aberystwyth, sold for £250, right? That's what it sold for. I bought it in 2000, and Molly and I bought it in 2002 or something. So that's uh, uh, 40 years later, for £120,000. And, and by the time I'd sort of split it and rearranged it and bought off Molly and all the rest of it, I got £450,000 out of it, but half of which went to the bank for mortgages. So this huge increase in the value of a property or of land or of some kind of object, of course it accrues to the benefit who own those, of those who own those things. Yes? But the poor people don't own those things. That's the point. Ordinary people, most of the people in the country, they don't own anything. So what they find is that they're increasingly impossible to do anything at all. They've lost all that money. It's been stolen from them by progress. That's what's happened. So this massive transfer of, 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 of value from the poor people, like most people, to the rich people, like few people, has occurred purely as a result of progress, scientific progress. Now you might wonder you might have thought, with all this development in scientific expertise and knowledge and things and all the rest of it, you know, that people would be, get, would be getting richer, but of course they're not. The rich are getting richer, but the poor are getting poorer, and that's why. So we have, we have town councils now, my own town council in Biddeford, but all of the councils, Aberystwyth was the same thing. They can't, they can't and even the government, so the government can't survive either because of this, because of this increase in the amount of, of value that has accrued to the benefit of the banks. That's it. That's the idea. It's the tragedy of progress. Progress is impoverishing the poor. That's what it's doing. And it's wrong. It's wrong. It's immoral. But nobody's identified that as the source of the problem. So we can't, we can't afford hospitals, and we can't afford education, and we can't afford social services for old people. I say we. 
The government can't. The government can't because it's been priced out of the business, that's why, by the increased, increasing cost of everything. And the increasing cost of everything, including labour, is a consequence of the flooding of the planet with money. Right? But money's just paper, they just print it. And they call it debt. Who calls it debt? The banks call it debt and the bankers call it debt. So it's time that we got the banks and the bankers. That, that, that's the take-home message from this. They have impoverished the planet, except for the rich, by printing money. And here we have them here in Latvia too, they're everywhere, they're all over Europe and so forth, and everybody's starving because of the banks. Well, not entirely because of the banks, of course a lot of the money goes to to the weapons manufacturers and, you know, you name it, all the global, global, globalist bastards and all the rest of it. But they're basically the rich, they're the people, you know, and in little towns like Biddeford and all that, all they can do to survive is to sell things. So what they do is they, as they, they have a town council meeting, I'm sure. I haven't been there, but I can almost write the script, in which they say, how are we going to get enough money to do this and that? Oh, right, well, let's sell, sell off the allotment to get over there. Let's drive all the allotmentees off by, being, by acting badly, and then we'll sell it off for housing. And, of course, one of the councillors is going to have some husband who's a builder or something, and then the next thing you know is that they've said, oh, we don't need this anymore, we're going to have an allotment, but we'll move it from here, where it's in the centre of the town, we'll move it out to the stick somewhere, like in the middle of nowhere, that people can't get to. So we've still got allotments, but, but you know, you have to go about three miles to, find, to get to one, rather than just walking up the road into the town, where there's pressure on housing. Why is there pressure on housing? Because the council don't have any money, and there are always a load of vultures sitting in the background ready to, to exploit that situation and get money. And that's not just in Biddeford, it's, in, it's everywhere, it's everywhere. Anyway, that's it, the tragedy of progress. I think that's a new idea myself. I'm going to write it up in a paper and publish it. The tragedy of progress. I mean, apart from the fact that progress poisons everything and kills all the animals and the birds and all the rest of it, Let, don't stop me on that one. We've got to do something about it, all right? I'm, I'm behind all these climate, these climate revolutionaries. I mean... Good for them. But they don't sort of have a plan, you know, that's the problem. They don't have a plan. They don't know what to put in place. All they can do is, like all of the people who are anti-Iraq and all the rest, they can sit down in front of cars and they can block the traffic and all the rest of it. And the global people, they just laugh their socks off. They don't give a damn about those people. They think, ha ha. So we have to have a plan. Anyway, I've got a plan, you know, and sort of the Green Party has a plan. The Green Party is the only outfit that can deal with this, all right? If we get power in Parliament, then we can change the law. And, I, and, and there are all sorts of laws that we can bring in to just stop it now and survive. We can do that. We can do that. But of course, nobody really knows that we exist because we're a party of intellectuals. And they all think we're nuts. Anyway, we're not nuts. Well, I'm not nuts, anyway. OK, guys, there we are. The tragedy of progress. That's what it is. Progress is impoverishing the poor and taking, taking value from your children. All right? Let's do something about it together. Okay? I'm going to stand in Devon, in, in uh, Torridge and Devon, for the Green Party. So, so if, if you're out there, join the Green Party and vote for me. Because I can do something. I'm gonna. I mean, I. You know, don't you get angry looking at those fat bastards like uh, Cox, who's the, who's um, who's my MP. You know, I mean, the Attorney General. You know, lying through his teeth along with his fat bastard friend Boris Johnson and all those cronyist sort of Etonians. I mean, haven't you had enough of these people? I mean, what happened to what happened to revolution? Eh? I mean, what you know? Everybody just lies down and let these people walk on their faces. Well, it's time to stop, OK? It's time to stop them. So I've got out of my coffin at the age of 74. See what I can do. Join the revolution. Thank you. Scapegoat and I Went for a walk just to see what we would see the desert sand stretched far away but we knew that we were free but we walked along an ancient 
path I guess we knew what we would find I had a map She had her hopes We both had left The world behind And only say That long goodbye I hope you know What you will do We go to find what we have lost And to recover What is true The desert sands The trackless ways The endless sun The endless plain Scapegoat and I Walk on and on 